Because I that fucking Rene Dupree. I loved him as a talent. He, he but he got here. He was he was barely nineteen. He may have still been eighteen when they sent him down here, and he looked twenty eight. Huge guy, great size, great body, whatever. But he had a goddamn telephone because he's from uh, uh oh goddamn is it Newfoundland, New Brunswick? Where was it? Where was Emile Dupree? Where the Maritimes up there in Canada, over on the right hand side, past Nova Scotia, where it's even an hour ahead of fucking Eastern time. That's where his phone was from. And this was the the first era. This was 2003, 2004. People just getting cell phones, you know, widespread. So when he gets to Louisville, he calls me one day to go over, you know, what we'd like him to do and just get acquainted and everything. And I talked to him for about an hour. Well, he, did, he called me and left me a message. I called him back. I talked to him for an hour. Don't think anything of it. A couple weeks later, I got my phone bill. That phone call was 110 fucking dollars. I was not happy. I told him, I said, don't ever. I said, get you a goddamn phone in Louisville and don't ever expect me to call you ever again. You call me. Hey, let me ask you about Rene Dupree because obviously he had a great look. He had good size, a lot of potential, and he encountered a lot of problems in his career. A lot of people have attributed that to him being young and maybe immature. But what do you think? You had him there. You saw the talent. Does it bother you when a guy like that, I mean, he's not currently doing anything that I know of in wrestling, and you would think based on his age, he should be in the mix somewhere. Yeah. Does it bother you? I mean, Ken Doan, very similar. He was young, had a lot of potential. I heard similar complaints about him, immaturity maybe. What do you yeah. think when you hear this about some of these young guys you had in OVW that showed so much potential? Well, it it it, it, it hurts. I would say it breaks my heart, but I have no heart. But it, it just pisses me off because we were telling them at the time, we were telling the WWF office at the time, this guy's 19 years old, this guy's 18 years old. Ex you know, leave him here three or four years or open up another developmental territory and, and send him there after he has a good run here or whatever. You can't take these guys on the road at this age, especially when they're under 21. Under 25, you're not supposed to be able to rent a, a rental car. Although guys have gotten around that, uh, especially when they, you know, they're six foot four and whatever, people don't even look. But it just, it, Ken Doan had a lot of heat here because he was, you know, immature. I remember one time, I won't mention any names, but uh, Doan walks out of the Davis Arena after an OVW training session and he finds another one of the guys letting all the air out of his tires. Not punching the tires, not you know, cutting them, just letting the air out. You can pump them back up. And I remember Don, a guy told me, Don looked at him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm letting the air out of your tires. And Don said, why? He said, because you're a fucking prick. And we're all mad at you. And then he walked off and left Don to go get a fucking pump or some, find some way to pump his tires up. And so instead of taking that as, well, apparently a lot of people think I'm a prick. So I should possibly think about this and do something about it or because he wasn't at the point where he was like me and could give a shit, right? He still needed to go somewhere. He called the office and stooged and named names. And that was the end of a lot of his good treatment among the boys here for quite a while, if, if possibly ever. Um, but then, you know, guys get older and they get more mature and they realize what the fuck because it comes from Rene Dupree. He was a son of a promoter. He had, you know, 18 years old, and he's already 6'2", 6'3", and he's 240, and he's got a great body, and he's a good-looking kid. But just mentally and also, even if you've grown up around a business like Renee, you, you just – you don't get it that quick. And there are prodigies, obviously, Bobby Eaton – you know, it was 18, he was on top for, for Nick and partners with the promoter's son, but he was not only the nicest guy in the business, but a prodigy. Terry Gordy got it in the ring, but he and Michael Hazel both, you know, attest to the fact that when they were 19, 20, 21, they were hard as fuck to deal with. And it probably wouldn't be tolerated in today today's politer society. So 
<clears throat> I always thought, you know, yes, sign them up, put them in a place where they can train properly instead of leaving them out there on these jack off independence or, you know, just working from one place to another and, and not getting the proper experience. But don't put them in that atmosphere on national TV, traveling the fucking world, not just the country, but the world. Um, when they're not even old enough to legally fucking drink or whatever, that's just, that's trouble. And a lot of those guys fell victim to that. But then, you know, more fell victim to the bad booking because Johnny Jeter was the same fucking age. And he was the greatest kid and had no bad habits. And he was my champion in OVW when he was 19 or 20. And, you know, he would have been a guy that could have picked up and just gone and had no issues. And, of course, they fucking buried him. So, you know, it, it happened both ways. But, yeah, the younger you are like that. And especially at least in the territories when guys started as teenagers, most times they'd be thrown in a car with a veteran or two, usually the, to drive so the other guys could sleep if they want to or drink or whatever. But you would learn by osmosis, by hearing the guys talk. And it was all in the car back in those days. That's honestly one of the reasons I got in the business. Well, it wasn't a reason I got in the business. And afterwards, I realized how lucky I was. But when you first got in the business in those days, unless you became a main event level star working multiple territories at the same time, you never had to look at an airplane. Everything was in the car. And that's where all the fucking coaching happened and all the learning because nobody ever actually got in a ring and practiced because there were, you had no access to a ring and you couldn't go before the people were let in and practice your shit like they do now because the building people would see you, which would expose the business and the promoter would fire you. And it, it was all we could do to get to the matches an hour before bell time anyway. So it's not like we're going to show up in Biloxi, Mississippi at two in the afternoon to get in the ring and work out. Everybody knew how to do the moves. And if you didn't know how to do the moves, the veteran would show you by doing them all to you in your match that night in front of people. But the training was in the car, listening to the veterans talk. Jim Ross used to drive fucking guys like Akbar. Um, you know, Bobby Fulton drove guys like Bill Dundee when he was booking. So that's how he, you know, everybody learned in the car and in the locker rooms, talking to the veterans and listening to the veterans tell them not to fucking do the stupid shit they were doing because it didn't make any sense. And here's why, or here's how you do this or whatever the fuck on airplanes. You can't talk to each other like that. You know, you're definitely not riding down the road at fucking one in the morning and pitch black dark. You know, drinking and driving and fucking, you know, uh, carrying on and carousing, as they say. So, you know, I never liked airplanes to begin with. I did it because I loved the business so much and I loved the spot I was in. But in the old days, in the territories, you never had to see a fucking plane. I suspect Georgia was a fucking dream territory. The longest trip was four hours. Uh, uh, Florida. You know, if you went up to fucking Jacksonville or over to the Panhandle, it was a little Tallahassee or whatever. It was a little longer. But the meat of the matter, Florida was a great territory. Uh, the Fullers always started short trip territories, places where there were either beaches or lakes, like East Tennessee, short trips. Continental, Southeastern, and Alabama, short trips. Um, the Carolinas, before it got out of hand, North and South Carolina and Virginia, it could be challenging sometimes the double charleston trip was a rib charleston west virginia to charleston north carolina or south carolina but otherwise you were in a car every day you didn't have to see a fucking plane unless you wanted to and if i'd have known that the business rapidly was going to become a place where you had to fly everywhere i don't think i would have been as anxious to get into it but that's you know even even then on some of the private planes you could still learn something in some cases, learn not to get back in the private plane. Remember, I've told you the stories where guys in the Carolinas, to make the trips a little shorter, they would they would pay Ronnie Garvin because he had the, the plane, right? And he could fly, and they'd pay him something for trans and go up to the wilds of Virginia or whatever and land in a farmer's field and go to the spot show and then come back and take off and hopefully make it home. And... For a bunch of the guys that wanted to do that, that was fine. I never considered that. I'll just live in the fucking car. Because there was that. 
<clears throat> Barry and Kendall Wyndham told me this one. I think I've told this before. Search YouTube. You've got the time, people. You're at home. But if you haven't got the time to search YouTube, just listen to me. I'll tell it again. Barry and Kendall Wyndham fly with Ronnie Garvin, and I'm trying to think who else was in the plane. Can't remember. But there's four of them. Single-engine plane. They take off from Charlotte, and they go to some spot show up in Virginia. Where you know, And people are saying, well, they're flying to a spot show. It was... 200 miles away, but it was up in the mountains, so it was a little challenging. They're going to get home early. Um, plus, there's, you know, it's a high school gym. There's 1,500 people packed into it, so it's going to be a good payoff for those guys. They're on top, so they can afford it. But they land in a field that a farmer has. It's an open field with no trees or whatever, and Ronnie knew these people. He had places he could land his fucking plane out in the middle of nowhere with no airport all over this territory so that he could go and make these shows, right? So they land in the fucking farmer's field, and he's there to meet them, and he takes them in the fucking truck over to the school or whatever. And they have the show, and they come back. Well, now it's pitch black. It's fucking 11 o'clock at night. And they're saying, Ronnie, how are you going to take off? We can't see a goddamn thing. He tells the farmer, get in your pickup truck, drive down to the end of the field, and turn around pointing this way in front of the trees and turn your headlights on bright. Because if that way, if he clears the truck headlights, he's clearing the fucking trees, right? This is high-tech shit. So they're like, what the fuck? So he does it. He In this single-engine plane, brrr, he, uh, down the field, and he takes off, and he goes over, and they say they're clearing the truck, and they're clearing the trees. And they're like, all right. And they're flying back to Charlotte. And about halfway back to Charlotte, Ronnie says, huh? they say, what's the matter? They, my alternator's going out. Because he had had an issue I guess planes have alternators too. He actually, they had seen him hook his plane up to jumper cables to the farmer's pickup truck. Oh, man. I'm serious. They'd see it, and he still got back in his fucking plane. So he said, the alternator's out. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's why we haven't got any lights. There were no lights on the dashboard suddenly. Now the fucking engines are running, or engine is running, and they're still flying, but they don't have electric power, right? So they can't use the radio. They don't have any lights. And then he says, well, I guess we're going to see if the fuel tank switch is electric. Because there's two fuel tanks. And when you use the fuel in one tank, you flip the switch and it goes to the other tank. If that operation is electric, they ain't going to make it. So he fucking, there's, he's got Barry Windham with a flashlight, holding the flashlight to the dashboard so he can see how to do this shit, right? Kendall, for some unknown reason, is in the backseat asleep. I don't know why he would be asleep through this unless he had some help. Ronnie flips the switch and boom, there we go. The, oh, okay, we're good. The other fuel tank kicked in. Now they get to Charlotte. And the thing is, you can't la- even though they don't land at the, on the same runways as the major delta jets and things and it's the middle of the night still you have to have clearance you have to talk to the control tower you have to be told where to go to to land a plane at the charlotte airport even in the private aviation section well they got no radio and they got no lights so what they do ronnie says if 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 they see me on the radar, they're going to get pissed. So he flies where the phrase came from, under the radar. They said that he flew, Barry told me this, he flew past the 28th floor of the 30-story bank building they built in downtown Charlotte. Oh, man. And Barry is kicking fucking Kendall in the back seat like, wake up, wake up, you're never going to see Charlotte like this again. So they fucking... They come in with no lights. Nobody knows they're coming under the fucking radar, 1.30 in the morning or whatever the fuck it is, and Ronnie lands at Butler Aviation, wheels the fucking plane behind a goddamn building. They all jump out, grab their bags, get in their cars, and go home. Nobody knew they, they were there. 
Next day, he went over and made, you know, arrangements for his fucking plane to put it back where it was supposed to be. That's why I didn't ride with the guys in, the, in their private planes. Where were we going with that? Uh, Rene Dupree. Rene Dupree. He never <laughs> rode with Ronnie Garvin either. That's right. Uh, someone in the uh, chats, um, in the comments, they asked the question um, about you doing a phone call and it costing over $100. Oh, yeah. Right. Tell us about it. So I called them for something, right? Now, mind you, I, I came from Canada. I was 18 and I had a Canadian cell phone. Now, I had like a international phone plan, right? So I could call anywhere in the United States. It was one set price a month for my phone bill. He obviously didn't. So I called him. There was no answer, but then he calls me back. Now, I'm not thinking about this. I'm 18. I'm not thinking about him not having a you know phone plan or whatever. So we ended up talking for you know, a good 30, 40 minutes. And then, uh, you know, it was all good, positive. So he calls me up and then we're talking for a good 30, 40 minutes. And about the next month, I think it was Danny. Yeah, I think it was Danny Davis. He said, Renee, Jimmy just got his phone bill. He's coming over here. He's fucking hot. It was $185. So I forget who I was with. I said, drive me to an ATM. So I collected and I got a hundred, I got $200 ready. So as soon as he walked in the door, he was red. The fucking steam was coming out of his fucking ears. I said, before you say anything, here's $190. And then all of a sudden, like the temperature in his face, he started to like regain his color. <laughs> Look at that, get yourself an American phone. God, Canadian phone, god damn. But, uh, but yeah. Then I heard his podcast. He saying he claimed it was one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Well, I give you one hundred and ninety, so that means off that thirty-minute phone call, you made sixty-five dollars profit. So you have no fucking reason to complain. My point of view. So there, that's the story. I can just imagine when you say his temperature was going down. You know, them ferometers when it's like red at the top and it just drips. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what it is.